Welcome to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Dan Dunn. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Um, Dan uh, has a PhD from Wayne State University. He is a professor at uh, Purdue University Northwest, the new name. His textbook is Communication Embracing Difference with co-author Lisa Goodnight. And Dan has won uh, teaching awards from the AMCO Foundation uh, for Outstanding Teacher and also the Central States Communication Association. Uh, one of the um, uh, interesting things about Dan is that he predicts the election uh, every four years, and he's been so accurate that his former students still contact him uh, after years and years yeah. sometimes and ask him who's going to win. So uh, we, maybe we'll ask him that at the end of the okay. uh, uh, half hour here. Uh, I, I've got my own prediction, which I'll share. Um, but Dan, um, I just want to get started with a, with a broader question here, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I heard you introduced once as an American Dream Scholar. Okay. And, um, and I just thought it might be interesting to, to ask ourselves, where is the American Dream right now in this election? What, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be an American, and how are we redefining that right now? Well, the, the dream is, uh, I think, is, is really challenged in the country because um, we have become so divided. You know, when I, when I look at the American Dream, I, I think about um, confidence in government and political leadership. I think about confidence in foreign policy, the notion that nothing's beyond the accomplishment of an American, and a humanitarian and moral orientation that all Americans should have equal opportunity. But I think what, what's happening now is our- Something that Kennedy articulated so well yes. in 1960. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. You know, if you look at his inaugural address, yeah. you can see how he touched on those points. Yeah. You, you can also see it, how he refined his thinking he gave a tremendous speech at American University yeah. after the missile crisis that we all kind of breathe the same air. Yeah. But now it, it's just so polarized and you have a fear that the have-nots are getting larger compared to people who have things. And if, if you really look at the economy, that uh, you know wages have been stagnant for the last right. 15 years. So, you know, people who had money in the market, the market has recovered. Right. But you have a lot of people that feel left out and they feel, they feel frustrated in this election. And I think you see some of that frustration w within, within the campaign. So certainly the, there's been a shift towards emphasizing uh, economy and jobs. Uh, in in our lifetimes, but but I, you know it just seems to me if we go back to that American dream concept, it had more to do with, seemed to me anyway, lifestyle and opportunity, right. and certainly um, you know you need to be making a living in right. order to appreciate those things. But but it, it it just seems like today when we talk about issues like that, it really just comes back always to jobs yeah. and economy. And, well, well yeah. and, and when and when you think of a dream. You think yeah. of hope, you, yeah. you know, that, that the American dream, in, in my judgment, yeah. was something in the earlier time that you aspired to, that you didn't know that you would get, but you, it was something that you reached for, right. not necessarily lived in. And then we had an era, you know, and I think a, a lot of it dealt with the Kennedy era, that, where we thought the hope was in reach, it, then we watched it polarized. Well, all those assassinations yeah. in the 60s. And, yeah, you, yeah. You, you know, and you had uh, the, the left getting crushed in the 72 campaign with McGovern, yeah. and then after Watergate, people's confidence in government. Yeah. And, 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 and so I, I think we've become less hopeful as a country. And that's so a, is, is that why this campaign's a little meaner than yeah, what we're used to? It, it's, 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 it's mean. Um, I, I uh, and I think a lot of it is, you know, as a, as a public relations person, you know yeah. what the media does. You know, the media is going to pull out whatever is dramatic, right. you, you know, and, and so you see some of the stuff coming out over and over again, and they highlight, they highlight the mistakes, and both, um, both major party candidates have trouble right. with the media in, in, yeah. in different in different yeah. ways, yeah. and so it, it is negative, and and you sometimes get the feeling. I mean, you hear this in a lot of elections that you're voting for the lesser of two evils. Right. But you 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 hear more of that now. 
Yeah. You know, that it, it's not like people, there are some people in each camp that really identify with the players. They idolize, you know, each candidate. There's a, there's a group there's, that idolizes each candidate. Yeah, there, there's yeah. a cluster there. Yeah. But there's also a cluster of voters that are, are saying, you, you know, um, I'm not really crazy about right. either one of these candidates. Right. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote, in my judgment, the lesser of two evils. Yeah. And then you have... Uh, something unique, you have um, the Green Party candidate, which is uh, Stein, who it's a smaller crowd, but Gary Johnson, as a libertarian candidate, you know, he's polling in some polls around 9, 10 percent. That's you know, large. Yeah. That, that is very large for a, you know, when you look at third party candidates, yeah. you think of Ross Perot in 92 and 96 when yeah. he was around 18 percent, I think, yeah. and Wallace in 68 at uh, yeah. a little over 13 percent right. in the end. And here he's at 9%. If he should happen to hit 15%, he'll participate in the debates. So he could have, right. he could have some impact and some voters that are just frustrated, yeah. they may turn to him or Interesting Stein. potential then, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, and uh, you know, when, when you, especially when you look at a libertarian candidate, the, the philosophy is that uh, you have very little government Right. But you right. have, the government is, you're very, the government is not in your lives on social issues. So it's a... It's a and, and Hillary's the champion of the social issues, yeah. so there's a lot of contrast there. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the Republican Party's uh, take on that, I mean, they've, you know, they've been making less government a big issue since Reagan. Sure. Um, but, um, but not as big of an issue as the libertarians are making, right? right? So, so if... Um, if the libertarian becomes involved, I'm guessing, uh, I'd like to know what you think, but I'm guessing that's more likely to pull votes away from Trump than away from Clinton. Could, could be, could be, could be, you know, we, if, if, if um, and again, both libertarian candidates, uh, Weld and Johnson, Weld the VP and Johnson uh, the presidential candidate, they were yeah. both Republican governors. You know, yeah, two-term right. governors, right. one from New Mexico, the other one from Massachusetts. So, um, y you know, it's, it's hard because the, the other thing that, that seems apparent now is that, that Trump seems to have a ceiling, that he's, not, he's, he's hitting high 30s, the low 40s. It's Hillary that keeps moving. At right. one time, she was in the high 40s, now she's kind of dipped down. So you you again you you don't know if the if if uh, you you would think logically that the libertarian vote would take yeah. more away from Trump, but it, it you know it could be that it, that's a protest vote and it's impacting her. We'll just have to see. What you know one of the factors that um, I think might still play out is the email issue, yep. and and you know right now as it's being discussed, the 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 main issue is you know that. Hillary shouldn't have used a private email server uh, that that put um, uh, state secrets at yep. risk. But um, in terms of the campaign, I'm just thinking, you know, when has a candidate ever had thousands of their private emails made right. public? And, and I think what the big threat for Hillary is not the fact that she used this server, but the fact that all of these private emails are being made public now. Yeah. And, you know, the chances are she said something in there yep. that... Um, is more than just offensive. She said something that maybe is, you know, could cost her an election. Yep. Uh, she's may said something that may have uh, been a bigger crime than the fact that she was using the uh, the server. Now I don't think that she did or didn't, but I just yeah. think that that there's a there's an additional risk yep. factor at play here because of that. Well, well, there, there's you know, and again, if we, if we look back, and I won't go in great detail, yeah. you know, part of her difficulty was how she handled this. Yeah, you, oh, yeah. You know, you know we learn. That and, and you know, as a public relations expert, yeah. if if you have bad news, you don't want to have several cycles no. of that bad no. news. I mean, right. you want to kind of you own that. up to it. Yeah, you take the heat you, you and know, get over it, and you move on. Uh, yeah. Since we were talking about Kennedy today in class with the Bay of Pigs, I just want to, yeah. you know, he he made a terrible decision. He, you know, his leadership was was difficult during the Bay of Pigs invasion, and he. He floundered into this groupthink phenomenon. But what he did at the end, he was smart enough to say, I made a mistake. 
Okay. Yeah. You, you know, I take responsibility for this. It won't happen again. Right. I'm putting together a fact-finding commission. Right. And what this did is it stops the media right. from hounding. Right. You know, because the media Reagan will, did it with Iran Contra. Yeah. He gave the, the happened on my watch speech. Right? Yeah. yeah. You, you know, he let it linger for a while, but then he came. You know, I yeah. they told me about this, and yeah. I just forgot. Yeah. You, you know, so it is it is so and a lesson for a politician, and we have seen it impact this campaign, yeah. is when you make a mistake, yeah. own it and, and apologize. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you know, uh, Trump had a um, interaction with Megyn Kelly, you know, and um, during the debate, you, you, you know, and he, he made some references to her and right. things he shouldn't have said, you, you know. Right. And Megyn Kelly, uh, Megyn Kelly, then said, okay, called him up, met with him at Trump Towers. So she went to his place right. to make peace, right. okay? And she meets with him, and he, she says to him, y you know, you know, you called me a bimbo. And his opportunity then would say, you know, I made a mistake. Yeah. I said the wrong words. Yeah. All he says is, oops. And so, and so <laughs> he has this tendency, they, they both, don't own up well, yeah. but he has this tendency when he says something somewhat outrageous, he doesn't let it go. Yeah. You know, then yeah. he starts tweeting about well, this they, they seem to both be a little bit more arrogant than what yeah. we're used to. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Romney yeah. was, uh, you know, kind of a humble guy for yeah. somebody who was running for president yeah. and was in the thick of things. And, you know, Obama, you know, people think he talks a little bit like a lawyer, but yeah. I don't know that, you know, you would say he was arrogant, but I just, I, I pick that up and hear people saying that about, about both candidates. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And that keeps you from saying I was wrong, right? It, it keeps it, you and from they, feeling they, a need to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and they both have such trouble with the media. Yeah. They, they yeah. both have such trouble with the media, yeah. you, you know, and, uh, and, and I think that that has, you know, contributed to some of the despair that people have with, with, with this with this particular right. election. You, you know, you, you know um, uh, why he did all that name calling is yeah. just beyond me. You know, well, you know, I think he's just saying what's on his mind, and I right. think there's that that element that you say that you know stays in support of him is appreciating the fact that he's yes, not politically correct. you're absolutely and right. We are going to discuss this when we come back. Oh, okay, um, and we'll also have uh, some predictions. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, uh, and the Kelly Met Roundtable will be right back. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. My guest today is Dr. Dan Dunn of Purdue University Northwest. Uh, Dan has been uh, teaching political communication, political rhetoric courses for years, and we're continuing our discussion on the upcoming election. Yeah. Um, should we uh, talk about the vice presidential candidates for a minute? Sure. Um, is one of them having more impact on the race than the other one by any chance? I think, no, I actually think that they both made good choices for mm -hmm. their needs. I think Pence helped Trump uh, tighten the conservative wing in the party because when you, when you look at the, the conservative wing to a certain extent, they felt in 2008 that maybe John McCain was not a true believer. Right. Romney in 2012, you know, he had, he had produced... Um, a health care program yeah, for, for Massachusetts. The precursor of Obamacare. Obamacare. Right? Yeah. 
And so the conservatives... Um, and neither one appealed to what used to be called the religious right, which right. was the core. Right, right. Yeah, group. It, you yeah. know, and, and, uh, and, and so Pence is a true conservative. Yeah. And he helped, I think, uh, tighten that base because nobody's really quite sure of Trump because Trump, you know, was a Democrat. He was oh. pro-choice, then he was pro-life. And so I think It's not like he's been consistent since the race started right, either. Right, 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 right. But, but Pence actually took some really radical yeah. positions as governor. It yes. seemed like he was making a mistake. Yeah. You know, uh, those of us who, uh, who teach in Indiana, it right. looked like he was making a mistake, but it might be some of those very conservative statements yes. that he made actually are what put him in position for Trump to right. select him. Because, you know, when you look at their personalities, they're, they're very different. Y yeah. You know, a lot of people thought that Trump was going to choose either Christie or Gingrich because they're more yeah. out, they're more like him. Yeah. But, I, but I think that Pence was a good choice. And I also think that Tim Kaine was a very good choice. I, Tim Kaine was on Obama's short list in 2008, right? yeah. you know, he was one of the top four, and and he has a very solid record, mm -hmm. and and he's not going to overshadow her, you, you know, he's he's a yeah. quieter personality, and at the same time, you know, he was a senator, a governor, and so I think both of them made good choices for their particular needs, you know, and I heard, you know, that really yeah. it was the influence of the Trump family that was really pushing for Pence, oh. you know, but but Kane had, was on every everybody's short list. So really? I think I think they were really good choices, you know. For, okay. And then um, uh, what about the conventions? Did you know? Did they both get a, a good running start out of the conventions, or did they did they fumble a little bit? Yeah, you, you know, there there were uh, a few moments in the Trump convention, you know, when Melania. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Yeah, His yeah. wife, you know, gave a speech, and it was a touching speech, but she had somebody help her write it, and it turned out that there were some uh, phrases was, from Michelle Obama. Yeah. And, and the problem was it was a three-day spin yeah. before they kind of owned well, plus it. Plus she was talking to an audience that hates Obama. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, she was just inspired by, uh, that's true, you, you know. <laughs> And so uh, that, that, was, that was a problem. And then the Cruz moment at that convention, you know, um, at that convention, Cruz was given the opportunity to give a speech. And was it, before we go any further, why, why in the world did he trust Cruz to go give that speech? Who knows, you know, because he, he did do something unique there, you know, but, but with, with I mean, Cruz. Did, did, did Carter let uh, Kennedy give a speech? And, uh... <laughs> well, well yeah, Kennedy's name was a nomination, yeah, so he gave yeah, his, he yeah, did right, give a speech. Right. Okay, you're right. But yeah. you, you know, I mean, so it was just it was this hard. I mean, it was a bitter, bitter, bitter battle. primary race, and he invites the guy up on the podium. And then what what he does what he does is he says that um, Cruz says, uh, you know, vote your conscience, yeah. and everybody's mad, you know. Yeah. So Trump then walks out, and you know, yeah. in the middle yeah. of it, but then. So, so that was a that was a moment that didn't have to happen. And then you know, Cruz, uh, excuse me. So Cruz, the key thing is Cruz did not endorse Trump. Right. The expectation was there's going to be this endorsement, and it, it doesn't come. It doesn't come. Which is a which is a blow to Trump. Right. And then yeah. you know, Trump couldn't let it go. He then um, uh, the day after the convention, he has a news conference and. He starts talking about Cruz, and he brings up the stuff about Cruz's father that, <laughs> that he may have had something to do yeah. with the Kennedy assassination. Right. So that becomes right. a, a soiled news story. Right. Hillary's. I thought a, Bush's family was responsible yeah. for the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> anyway, I did, now this now this yeah. conspiracy is getting yeah. bigger. But anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and 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 for Hillary's convention, um, uh, you, you know, I, I think her speech went well. There, there were a lot of, uh, Bill's speech was good, her yeah. daughter's speech was good, and I would say that Trump's children at his convention w really looked very, very good. Yeah. V looked yeah. very, very good. So uh, she got a, a slightly bigger bounce, and then you had the... Well, plus you had Bernie right. endorsing right. his opponent, which, which Trump couldn't get. Right, right. 
Right, you, you know, and, and Bernie was able to get a lot of influence on that platform. Oh, he was, uh, yeah. you, you, you know, so. It was his audience. I mean, yeah. They, you know, he got the most enthusiastic responses. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, he, because, because when you look at Sanders' appeal, yeah. his appeal was more towards the, the hardcore activists. Y yeah, y y you know, which is interesting because he was in some way appealing to people who are of a, you know, different opinion, but the same kind of hardcore mindset as Trump was appealing absolutely. to on the other side of the coin, right? Absolutely. So yeah. that's, you know, so you have these two extremes out there, yeah. you, you know, but we know that in the end, elections are one in the middle. Either you're a little bit to the right of center, right. a little bit well, to the left of center. That doesn't leave much hope for Trump. Then. You, 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 you know, yeah, because, because um, when we've had historically, like yeah. when McGovern in '72 right. represented, he was annihilated. Right. When we had, when we had Goldwater in '64, he he was annihilated because they were seen as somewhat outside the mainstream. Right. You, you know, Reagan. And this is really Goldwater's platform that's yes. come back here that Trump's yeah. running on. Yeah. yeah. Goldwater, he's got a little bit of Goldwater. He pulled out this silent majority stuff from Nixon. Which didn't work for Nixon. No. It was a joke. It, it, right, right. It, it, he, well, what Nixon did is he pulled this from, he had talked about these forgotten Americans at his convention. Yeah. He says, I'm one of you. And then yeah. he gets into trouble, you know, with the moratorium on the war. So he coins the silent majority phase right. and then unleashes Agnew and Agnew gets right. his whole new identity. Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, uh, but, but you're right. It, it, it's really the passion on the extremes that, that, that have uh, created the greatest energy. So on the Democrat side, um, Hillary gets Bernie's endorsement, right? So yeah. we have a coming together yeah. of these streams here, right? Yeah. And, and with a candidate who's going more towards the middle of the road, right? Yes. Not that much, but yes. more. Yes. And, uh, and on Trump's side, uh, coming out of the convention, you've got a lack of unity, Yep. right? Um, and a candidate who's really not paying much attention to middle of the road yep. kinds of positions, right? Yep. So by conventional wisdom here, no pun intended, yeah. um, we've, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a weak, Trump's in a weaker position to move yes. forward, right? He's also, the other issue that he has to face are the changing demographics yeah. in our society. Yeah. You, you know, in 1988, Bush won about 59% of the white vote, and he yeah. won. Romney did the same in 2012, and he lost. So the, the country's becoming more diverse, and... You, you know, when, when there are some of these dramatic statements so it's th that I know appeals to his base and they love it, but, but when he, you know, when he says things about Mexicans and, yeah. you, you know, you know, and, and uh, uh, this can alienate some voters, you, you know. Well, so they said early on that for a Republican to win, he had to get 40% of the Mexican-American yeah. vote. Right, and he's not. Anywhere he's not going to get that. But are we throwing that out the window now? Because it seems to me one of the things that might have happened here that, that throws off all the bets is that Trump may be bringing people to the polls that don't ordinarily vote, and and most of the predictions and the and the wisdom of you know how to run this yeah. is based on uh, you know surveys. And the first question they ask you is, did you vote in the previous presidential election? Yeah. And if you say no, they throw you out. Yeah. Right. So they're yeah. only looking for people who actually vote. So, but but now. There's different people coming to the polls. Right. right. Trump is bringing in new people. And I think you yeah. notice when he brought on Kellyanne, Kellyanne Conway yeah. as his new campaign manager. Right. She's tried to soften him a little bit. And, and so you see him going to African-American churches. Now, I don't think he's going to get a large African-American vote. <laughs> I don't think he's going to get a large yeah. Latino vote. Yeah. But I think what he's trying to go after is the college-educated Republican suburban voter that might be able to see him as more plausible. So I think that this was a strategy because he, because she is doing better with white voters that are college educated, which is an anomaly, you, you, you know. 
Yeah, well, and we're probably going to have to uh, uh, end on this okay. with the, and, and go to our predictions okay. right now. But, um, you know, uh, in, in the study I'm of so, rhetoric... I'm so chatty. I'm the, sorry. No, no, you're doing good. Yeah. But in the study of rhetoric, you know, the, the, the classical rhetorician said that somebody who um, has uh, feeble, mixed-up words when they speak probably has feeble, mixed-up thoughts, yeah. right? So how does an educated voter listen to Trump bumbling through these speeches and contradicting himself yeah. and then take him seriously? Yeah. Um, so yeah. just quickly on that, I mean, you know, how do they, how, why do you think people are looking past how he's coming across? I don't know that they are. I, I think that that was really, I think that was part of his strategy. I mean, I, I think in, in the end, if, because, because I know we have to get to the end, yeah, yeah. that if things stay the way they are right now, yeah. and there's not any huge dramatic change, yeah. Hillary's going to be elected. I agree with you. I think Hillary's going to win in a landslide. What do you think about that? In the electoral college, elect, electoral college yes. I, yeah. Okay. You know, I think the popular vote... You know, I'm not sure on that, but in yeah. the electoral, 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 I yeah. teach speech. In the electoral <laughs> college, yeah. uh, I think that... Um, do I as think, we say, not as we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that um, if everything holds, yeah. she's going to end up with more than 300 votes. Yeah. Um, yeah, they refer to uh, Reagan's uh, victory in 80 as a landslide, but he really only had 51 Right. Of the it vote, wasn't a landslide. But it was an electoral right. landslide. Right. Yeah. That election turned at that debate. The, you know, when yeah. Reagan is up there with, with Carter and he looks yeah. human, and then Reagan yeah. has this and line. And he says, there he goes again. Yeah, yeah, he said, yeah there he goes again. And, yeah. and Gergen had actually given him this close. Yeah. You know, if you think you're better off now, yeah. Yeah. you know, vote for him. Yeah, yeah. And, that was, and, and the that economy was, was awful, 18% yeah. inflation, yeah. Uh, yeah. uh Gas lines. Yeah. So we we'll leave you with those thoughts uh, about how bad things can get. Um, that's all the time we have for our program. Thank you uh, for joining us today on Kelly Met Roundtable. Um, I'm your host, Tom Roach. Have a great day. Thanks, Tom.